you for watching this virtual lecture event. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition cost. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. Dr. Mara Kodakiewicz holds the Kosciuszko Chair in Polish Studies at the Institute of World Politics, where he also serves as a professor of history and teaches courses on geography and strategy, contemporary politics and diplomacy, Russian politics and foreign policy, and mass murder prevention in failed and failing states. He's the author of Intermarium, The Land Between the Black and Baltic Seas, and numerous other books and articles. He holds a PhD from Columbia University and has previously taught at the University of Virginia and Loyola Marymount University. Dr. Hodokiewicz, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. It's business as usual at IWP, and we shall continue with our story, horrible story in a way, of World War I and its aftermath. Um, today, our lecture is particularly painful. We will study the path towards armistice. So we'll discuss the period between spring and autumn of 1918. Why is this a particularly harrowing story? It's because we signed an armistice with Germany prematurely. As always, I will start with a, a few quotes, three, uh, three quotes. First one is from Teddy Roosevelt on October 23rd, 1918, former US president wrote, let us dictate peace by the hammering guns and not chat about peace to the accompanied, to, to, to the accompan accompaniment of the clicking of typewriter. And the second quote is from General John Pershing, Commander in Chief of US Expeditionary Forces. On October 25th, 1918, uh, General Pershing said, the complete victory can only be obtained by continuing the war until we force unconditional surrender from Germany. Unfortunately, Roosevelt was not in power, and General Pershing was a military man in a democracy where power is vested in civilians, in this case, in President Wilson. However, the person on the ground most responsible, most responsible for prematurely throwing in a hat in essence and not finishing the business was uh, David Lloyd George. And here is a um, quote from General Douglas Haig, the commander in chief of the British forces on the Western Front on October 19th, 1918, he said, Mr. Balfour spoke about deserting the Poles and the peoples of Eastern Europe, but the Prime Minister, David Lord George, gave the opinion that we cannot expect the British to go on sacrificing their lives for the Poles. It was pretty straightforward. A decision came at the top. But let us backtrack to the spring of 1918 when taking advantage of the peace of Brest in the spring of 1918, Germany transferred a chunk of its uh, armies to the West. Berlin launched another offensive against France and Great Britain. The key was 
to win before the United States made a difference on the Western Front. Unfortunately for Germany, it was too late. The United States joined the war, which immediately, almost immediately, immediately caused the stopping of the German offensive and it's actually pushing it back in August 1918. The Germans would refer to it as the Black August. The Allied undertook a counteroffensive with a great success, in particular uh, in September 1918 on the Western Front, it looked by World War I standards that the Allied forces turned into a steamroller. For the first time, German regiments would surrender and block. Further, the Allied, the Allied pierced the line of central powers, both in the Balkans and in the Middle East. Bulgaria collapsed. Turkey began to shake seriously. In Germany and Austria, there broke out strikes. The military mutinies, in particular, in uh, the German Navy. Defeats on German defeats on the Western Front and inadequate benefits from economic exploitation of the occupied Ukrainian and other lands caused a situation where the war weariness and disinclination and opposition to the governments in Vienna, Berlin, and Budapest transformed into the simmering of the revolution. Soon, the revolution spread to other towns from the capital, and then it metastasized everywhere. Mutinies in the army and the navy occurred hand in glove with a uh, social revolution and irredentist uprisings of uh, national minorities. As a result of all of this, the rulers of both states, Germany and Austria-Hungary, abdicated. The dynasties of the Hohenzollern and the Habsburg collapsed. They were replaced with republics. Usually, the republics, the new republics, were led by social democrats and liberals who became a target of assault by the communists, by the Reds. And this is at precisely this time when uh, this unfortunate ceasefire was signed on November 11th, 1918. It was concluded before a total conquest and occupation of the Second Reich. Let us stress the enormity of this tragedy. It is clear that the result of mainly liberal politicians' embrace of a, uh, an inadequate measure to solve the situation in 1918 paved the way to 1939, eschewing a total victory in World War I meant World War II, including the Holocaust.
Hence, this is a harrowing story. Therefore, very influential Republicans in the US, led by Teddy Roosevelt, called for the continuation of the offensive. And the commander in chief of the United States Expeditionary Forces in Europe, General John Pershing, called for uh, likewise an assault on Berlin until an unconditional surrender. Unfortunately, liberal leaders ignored such wise voices. In particular was the Prime Minister of Great Britain, David Lord George, who opposed a logical solution. In consequence, the Germans refused to acknowledge that they were defeated. And therefore, they decided to fight another war 20 years later. Throughout the entire interna uh, interwar period, they armed themselves. They continued to fight, or they were preparing for a new fight. In this sense, November 11, 1918, was a strategic tragedy. As far as its uh, influence on the Intermarium in general, the failure of the proposition of unconditional surrender spelled leaving very many trump cards in Germany's hands. First, no allied forces reached Poland and other countries of the region. Second, because of that, the German armies remained in place. Third, those forces were capable of continuing a policy of favoring on the occupied territories, those political options they favored, in particular the Germanophiles, as well as the nations they preferred over others. For example, the Lithuanians vis-a-vis -vis the Poles. Fourth, and this must be the most important, Henceforth, it was contingent upon the goodwill and cooperation of the former soldiers of the Kaiser to see how, how fast Bolshevism would be spreading to the West. From the Polish point of view, the armistice in the long run was a catastrophe just like for the rest of, or for most of humanity. In a short run, this was minimum a um, diplomatic catastrophe for the Poles in the West. Unlike the Czechs and the Serbs, the Poles were not invited to the pre-conference to prepare the armistice. The Polish warnings about Bolshevism were roundly ignored. The Polish requests to turn over German weapons to the Poles were absolutely rejected. There were there was no agreement at all to recognize Poland's petition to transfer the blue Polish army via Gdansk or the Balkans to Poland. At the same time, the Czech postulates, similar postulates to move Czech troops from the West to, to, to send them home were warmly endorsed by the liberals. The greatest disaster for the Poles was the fact that the allied governments refused, aside from 
very bashful protestation by the French. The Allied governments refuse to proclaim that the partitions of the Commonwealth in the 18th century were both illegal and no longer applicable. Because of that, the conditions of the armistice required of the Germans to withdraw merely to the pre-war border of August 1914 and not the evacuation of the entire Prussian partition of Poland. This neglect, this uh, short-sightedness guaranteed practically a border war between defeated Germans and the nascent uh, uh, resurrected Polish state. An allied intervention, which never materialized, alas, could have <coughs> limited this conflict just to Silesia. Finally, a direct recognition in the conditions of the armistice of the pre-war, pre-World War I borders also meant that the Poles in Wielkopolska, Great Poland, Pomorze, Pomerania, Śląsk, Silesia, and East Prussia, Mazury, continued to suffer uh, the, the um, impact of the Allied economic blockade. The architects of all these anti-Polish and essentially anti-freedom loving moves were first of all David Lloyd George and his foreign secretary, Lord Balfour. They care primarily about the balance of power. They did not want to strengthen France because they didn't want it to become a dominant power on the continent. In their relationship with the Germans, they were interested mostly uh, in the weakening of the uh, of the navy of Berlin. So, in this way, London displayed an unbelievable and singular short-sightedness and a lone exemption from this morbid rule was the ever bold anti-Bolshevik Winston Churchill. In 1918, in the West, the war ended. The guns fell silent. In the East, the war continued. Initially, at least, Germany deluded itself that it could save the status quo ante. And it could even solidify its influence in the intermarium. However, very soon, anarchy at the very heart of the German state forced a radical change of plans. Meanwhile, Red Russia pushed with a torch of the revolution towards the East. Once again, had we heeded the advice of General John Pershing, Teddy Roosevelt and others, the allied forces would have taken Berlin, the Germans would have known right away they lost the war there would have been an unconditional capitulation. We failed to do it because the liberals decided against it. 
they left Germany sorely shaken, but standing. This was a huge mistake. Therefore, David Lloyd George and his ilk are responsible for World War II and the Holocaust. That is why the story of the armistice is one of the saddest parts of our discussion of World War I and its aftermath. Thank you, and we shall see each other next time. I would like to thank Dr. Hodakevich and all of you who tuned in. If you are interested in attending other upcoming events, supporting IWP, or apply to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Again, that's iwp.edu. Thank you.